Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. There's been a lot of response to our Cut the Clutter episode a couple of days back on the Kachatibu issue. Now, there's a lot of response and I notice there is a lot of doubts also. There is not a lot of doubts. There is some understanding. There is also some areas where there is confusion because a lot of us in India, I know that there is a lot of India is coastal. Maybe people who live in coastal areas have better understanding of maritime issues, but definitely those of us in landlocked states sometimes are a little bit lacking on it. In any case, these are complex issues and that's why I see many questions from so many of you, hundreds of you. I read your responses. So thank you very much for responding. Thank you to those who have said good things, who have praised this episode. Thank you also to those who've been critical because what you say is very valuable. In fact, invaluable because sometimes it also helps us correct things. In this case, however, I think it is useful for, for me to explain to you what exactly happened because I see questions like, oh, this much territory was given away. How do you say this was too little territory? How much territory is too little? How much is too large? Or the question of, did Mrs. Gandhi give it away without a quid pro quo? Was it just a gift to Sri Lanka in 1974? Was Indra Gandhi's government in 1974 representing a weak India or a powerful India? Was it an act of weakness or strength? All those are subjective as well. But what is not subjective is the facts on the ground. So the questions I see, for example, probably the most asked question in this engagement, the six or more than 600 plus responses. In fact, by the time I'm speaking with you, it might be, might be much more than that. 600 plus when I last checked, a lot of the responses are, oh, if this island was given away, then what about all the exclusive economic zone around it? So 200 kilometers of economic exclusive economic zone around around an island must have also been given away. So this was a big sacrifice that India made or, or, or a big gift that India gave to Sri Lanka. I know also from where this understanding is coming. This understanding is coming from what the Chinese are doing in South China Sea. They go, they conjure up an island, they take sand, they see a shallow area, they create an island, they put an airstrip there and they say this is our island. Then all the area around it, 12 nautical miles of ter territorial waters and 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone is ours. So they operate like this. And because we've been watching this very closely, we, we've been watching the Chinese do it now, now for more than almost two decades, much more in the last decade, in the Xi Jinping decade. So the impression is that if an island is given away in the seas, all of these EZ also must have gone. Now to understand that, we have to look at a map because what is what is the best fact check? The best fact check is a map on the ground. So this is a map. Please see this map on your screens. This is not a map that we have drawn. This is not a map that our graphic team has drawn. It is not also a map that any particular side has drawn. This is a map that the United Nations Treaty Series has. United Nations has documentation which has all kinds of treaties listed between nations and on issues. Also, this is a map from United Nations Treaty Series that's been submitted. It's a 1977 map that's been submitted by Government of India in an RTI reply on, on the Kachatibu issue. One of the two RTI replies we spoke about, this is the 2015 RTI reply. So this is the map on your screens. I am holding it here. Now, if you see this map carefully, I will point out some places to you and those will be highlighted on your screen. And then I will tell you some distances. And also I will explain to you what these facts on the ground mean, because that should then set aside many of the doubts which have come up. So first of all, if you see this map, this is this is Indian territory. This is the east coast of India. This is the east coast of India or Tamil Nadu. 
Then this comes into Dhanush Kodi, Pamban Island, or or Rameshwaram area. Then it comes to the Dhanush Kodi, and and then Ram Setu. This is Ram Setu. This goes towards Manar in Sri Lanka. Now up to here is Indian land territory. Remember, up to here on Pamban Island, up to this edge is also Indian territory, right? Then what happens? Then you see. The Kachatiwu Island. Again, you see it on your screens. Maybe that will be better than look, looking at me here. Look, look at your screen. Our production team will highlight it for you. This is Kachatiwu Island. Now you might think that oh, 200 kilometers from Kachatiwu Island, Sri Lanka has not got EZs. Then I tell you some basic fact. The basic fact is the distance between here, which is the closest Indian land uh, land point, closest point on the Indian coast from here to Kachatiwu, is exactly. 18 kilometers, 1-8, 18 kilometers. That is less than India's territorial waters. That's less than Sri Lanka's territorial waters. So no question of EZ there. Again, you might say, oh, but Sri Lanka has got our territorial waters. That cannot happen because in between this, the important thing is this line. This line deploys 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What is this line? And why has this line been drawn? This line is the Indo-Sri Lanka International Marine Boundary Line. So 1976, both countries formalized this line. This is the marine border between the two countries. Anything, this side of the line is Indian. There is no question of territorial waters or EZ. All this water is Indian. It's like Indian land. It's like, it's like, it's like these are not international waters. This is Indian waters and it's like equivalent to Indian land. Similarly, everything on this side is equivalent to Sri Lankan land. Once again, you say, oh, so this much more has been given to them. The fact is that just next to this and this as the crow flies and you can, you can see the scale on this map is not more than about seven to eight kilometers. It's Delft Island, which is enormously bigger than Kachatiwu. And that has always been known by Sri Lanka. There's been no dispute over that. So first of all, this question of territorial waters versus EZs is easily settled by just looking at this map and by understanding the distances. Remember once again, the distance between this point on Indian territory, Pamban Island to Kachatiwu is just about 18 kilometers. So once again, understand the landmarks, the places and distances. If you look at the width of Pog Strait, I had mentioned this in the earlier episode also, but the width of Pog Strait is at its narrowest is only 64 kilometers. At its widest is just over 136 kilometers. So it's not a channel where any side can look at EEZs or anything like that. That is the reason a maritime boundary line was drawn generally in the middle of this. So on this side, what, what, everything that is on the eastern side is Sri Lanka's, everything that is on the western side is India. So there is no confusion. Why was this maritime boundary line drawn? First of all, because the UN Convention on Laws of the Seas was coming in and India was going to ratify it and countries need to have maritime boundaries. And I will tell you what happens when they don't have maritime boundaries located. Second in this area, because of the confusion, there was a lot of smuggling and a lot of gun running. So boats from one side will come and challenge by the other side, will just go 100 meters to the other side and say, I'm, I'm in my waters. And this was leading to constant trouble. This was also leading to a lot of smuggling from both sides. Then later, this came handy for both India and Sri Lanka that there was a clearly divided boundary line when LTT and other groups started gun running and cash running, money running in this area because LTT was like a parallel government and these boats used to run and now it was very clear where the Indian Navy and Coast Guard operated, where the Sri Lanka Navy, it was a very small Navy at that point, if any at all, they operated and how they coordinated. That is the very congested nature of this sea lane and that is what need to, we, we need to understand. Now, first of all, let's try and understand how do territorial waters and EZs work. So, from your shores, India, and this is something that a Navy veteran has explained to me, from Indian shores, India has diurnal, diurnal shores, which means tide comes and goes twice in a day. So, when the tide goes, from where you see the land, from that point, if you draw 200 
नॉटिकल माइल्स 200 नॉटिकल माइल्स मल्टीप्लाइड बाय 1.852 टू कन्वर्टेड इनटू किलोमीटर्स इज 370.4 किलोमीटर्स दैट इज इंडिया और एनी कंट्रीज एक्सक्लूसिव इकोनॉमिक जोन 12 नॉटिकल माइल्स और 22.224 किलोमीटर्स इज योर टेरिटोरियल वाटर्स टेरिटोरियल वाटर्स नो बडी कैन कम इन विदाउट योर परमिशन एक्सक्लूसिव इकोनॉमिक जोन नो वन एल्स no other country or no other power or no other fisher, uh, fisher folk can operate without your clearance because that's your exclusive economic zone that is not available anywhere in anywhere in pak strait and that's why you have this international marine boundary line so the concept of ez and territorial waters as it applies to other coastlines which have which, which are facing wide open seas that doesn't apply here that said i told you also i will explain to you what happens when maritime boundary line is not drawn we keep reading stories all the time of indian fisher folk being arrested by the sri lankan side and their boats being impounded also what is more frequent is india and pakistan impounding each other's fishing boats and arresting each other's fisher folk in the sir creek area see that on your map sir creek area is in, on the western side in gujarat of guj of the coast of kutch now what happens there is you see very narrow and very mixed up channels of water there and that is where sits a nala it's a winding nala it's not a straight nala or nala as it's called it also has a troublesome name because this nala causes so much trouble and i think maybe that's the reason it's called harami nala its name is harami nala so i'm not using any cuss word here and maybe it's it has deserved that name because of the trouble around it now pakistan says draw the line through the nala like this draw a straight line india says no go like this or or maybe the other way around i don't know for sure but there is dispute over where to draw the international marine boundary line there that line has not been drawn that is the sir creek dispute between india and pakistan now what happens is our fisher folk go in that area pakistani fisher folk go in that area nobody knows what's where even if they have very good gpss because the boundary line marine boundary line is not defined anybody's coast guard or navy can come and catch fisher folk and impound boats from the other side and that tamasha goes on all the time and then you see these pictures of these hundreds of fisher folk being exchanged imprisoned fisher folk being ex exchanged at vaga border that goes on in fact at one point of time the admiral in charge of india's western naval command has mentioned to me that look do you know why this why this fisher folk risk their lives and risk their liberty to do this because this area also happens to be really rich in red snapper so next time you have your order your red snapper in a restaurant remember some indian fish, fisherman might have risked his life and liberty trying to catch this in this sir creek area so this is what happens when the imbl is not there international marine boundary line is not defined which is not the case fortunately on the pak strait side and that's why movement in that area has been reasonably smooth after 1974 and then the follow up agreement of 1976 there's been no trouble in that area in fact if at all when once india decided to fight the ltt and once india decided that it was wrong of them it was wrong of india to support sri lankan tamil tigers tamil gorillas by the way i had broken that story for india today in early 1984 i will show you some screenshots of that of that story it caused quite a bit of controversy because we found their training camps in india so until then indian authorities or indian intelligence or indian forces were allowing safe passage to ltt boats of ltt and other groups but once they decided to fight ltt and others then it became much easier to control this area because ltt had a very sophisticated gun running operation that in fact came to a head in 1993 ipkf had withdrawn before that but the indian navy and coast guard were still helping the sri lankans and protected protecting these waters because they did not want any gun running one to take place from indian coast and second they did not want ltt to come to the indian indian side and also find safe harbors there because they had so many guns so much ammunition and so much money and that's where i will also tell you the story of 
an operation called Operation Zabardast. So Operation Zabardast took place between January 13 and 16, 1993. That's when information was received. So a Dornier of Indian Coast Guard cited one suspicious ship, not a small ship, about 400 ton ship. This was called MV Ahat. Now MV Ahat is a ship that had been surveilled for some time. It was earlier called MV Yahata. It had been seen in Karachi port where it was believed that it was loaded with arms and ammunition by who else but ISI. And where else would a ship loaded with arms and ammunition by ISI be headed either to, 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 towards India or towards a group, towards a group or towards some place where it would harm the interests of India. So this ship took a circuitous route. It did not come from Karachi to India because it would have been caught. It went from Karachi towards Phuket, changed its name from MV Yahata. It became MV Ahat and then started moving towards the general Indian Sri Lankan situation. Now this ship, I won't say it was commanded by, but the senior most or the most powerful man on this ship was a man called Colonel Kittu, Colonel, quote unquote, Colonel Kittu or self-style Colonel Kittu. Kittu, full name Sadashivam Krishna Kumar, was a ranking LTT fighter. He was a ranking LTT fighter. He had carried out many operations. He was also somebody who worked overseas a lot. He had worked and he had gone on operations in Sweden. He was like the intelligence key figure in LTT. He was on that ship and he was bringing this enormous amount of arms and ammunition somewhere towards India, the Tamil Nadu coast and Sri Lanka. Nobody quite knows. Once the Indian Navy and Coast Guard spotted it, they began tracking it. They began tracking it and the two ships that were doing it, one was the Coast Guard, coast Guard vessel that is CGS Vivek and second was a Navy Corvette that is INS Kirpan. These two started trailing this ship. As they got closer to the ship, they asked the ship to surrender. The ship caught fire. This caught fire or this was set on fire. Who, who knows? But the fact is that some of the sailors surrendered and they were taken into custody by Indian Navy and Coast Guard. But Kittu and 10 other LTT cadres, and these were the top LTT cadres at that point, they decided not to surrender but to go down with the wreckage. It's also believed that they committed suicide, which was the method also of LTT people. In, in fact, for this operation, Indian Navy netted at least two Nausena medals for gallantry. One went to the captain of the ship, INS Kirpan. That was Commodore Arvind Raj Vardhan and also the Marine Commandos Officer Arvind Singh, who had won a Mahavir Chakra in 1987. And that's a story that I had covered for India today at that point of time. So I'm just telling you this story mostly to make you understand the complex nature of this area. Now, this ship, where was it headed? If it was headed for Sri Lanka, it had enough weaponry to make LTT sustain that war at a very high intensity for quite some time. If it was headed for India or Tamil Nadu coast, can you imagine the havoc it would have wreaked in Indian Tamil Nadu? The other question that is being asked is just how big is Kachatibu? Now, Kachatibu is if you look at various sources, it's, it's anything between 1.15 square kilometers to 1.5 square kilometers. Like while this land was given away, and marine boundary line was drawn in such a way that this fell on the Sri Lankan side. And remember, right behind it, they have the Delft Island, which is much bigger, right? While this was given, something else was taken from Sri Lanka in that same bargain. And please see a copy of the same agreement, that agreement also on your screens. That's also part of the same RTI reply from Government of India in 2015. This is the agreement over what is called as the Vodge Bank. Now, Vodge Bank is not it's not a land area. Vodge Bank is like a shallow area on the sea shelf. It's a shallow area on the sea shelf off the coast of Kanyakumari or Cape Comorin. And this, this goes into India's EZ up to 200 kilometers. This is where also Sri Lankan fisher, fishermen and Indians used to fish traditionally for a very long time. As part of the agreement in 1976, once the marine boundary line was drawn, that is when Sri Lanka conceded to India exclusive fishing rights and economic rights in this area and withdrew all their rights. In fact, as a measure of goodwill, India said that Sri Lankan vessels duly carrying Indian licenses will be allowed to fish in this area, but only for 
three years. The agreement also said that at some point of time, because there was a belief there would be petrochemicals or minerals found in this area. So if some point of time, if any of that is found, then India will notify the Sri Lankan side. So they will completely stay away from it. So India will have the exclusive economic rights in this area. So I will read from that agreement a para that says, if the government of India decides to explore the watch bank for petroleum and other mineral resources during the period mentioned in subparagraph 2, that's a three-year period in which the Sri Lankans had the grace to come and fish there. The government of India shall notify the government of Sri Lanka, the zones reserved for such exploration and the date of commencement of exploration. Sri Lankan fishing vessels shall terminate fishing activity, if any, in these zones with effect from the date of commencement of exploration. So, so this was this was a complex agreement. There was something given, there was something taken as well. Now, how big is Watch Bank? Watch Bank is 3000 square miles area or 7770 square kilometer, kilometer area. In a lot of the research that's taken place, going back to 19th century, then into 20th century and again lately a 1987 report by the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute which is headquartered in Cochin. This has been, this has been seen or this has been acknowledged to be among the most fish rich area along India's coastline. And that then became an area where, where Indian fishing got exclusive rights. And you know what? There was a talk of hydrocarbons and petrochemicals. So all this while, nothing much happened there. But only in January this year, this year in January, January 2024, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas, they issued a notice inviting offers, that is NIO, Notice Inviting Offers, under Hydrocarbon Exploration and Licensing Policy or HELP Policy, Modi government likes acronyms, for exploration for oil and petrochemicals and gas in this area. So this is an area which is live. It's an economic asset. So if you see the Kachatibu issue, there's no point seeing it in isolation. First of all, we have to see it in terms of the geography and the facts on the ground and the distances and the complexity of the seas there and the narrowness of the channel. And second, we have to see the big picture by seeing Kachatibu with Watch Bank. Now, since I have the opportunity and you got me started, 1974 is when all of this is happening. Now, we say, oh, 1984 was the most newsy year in India's history. 1989, what a newsy year in India's history. Rajiv Gandhi's government got defeated, right? 1987, Bofors happened, IPKF happened, tension with China happened, Sumdurong Chu, brass tax happened. Or we say 1992, Babri Masjid was destroyed. So there, there are many news years. 1974 also, since we have an excuse, I will just give you a list of things that were happening in 1974. Around time, this Indra Sri Mavo agreement was signed, leading to, leading to Sri Lankan ownership of Kachatebu island being formalized. Sri Lankans had controlled it since 1921. Now let me take you back to 1974. 16th of March, it was a very news year. 16th of March 1972, Navnirman Andolan started in Gujarat. Again, Chiman Bhai Patel's government or Chiman Chor as he was called. Just as it started, within two days, Jayaprakash Narayan's movement started in Bihar. Both of those became national movements that ultimately led to the formation of the Janta Party and the defeat of Mrs. Gandhi, but before that also led to the emergency. So these two crises had come in the year 1974, before the month of June when the Kachatibu agreement was signed. Then we come to the month of May. Month of May, 8th of May, George Fernandez launched his railway strike, which at that point was the largest ever strike launched by any bunch of workmen anywhere in the world. So. 8th of May, George Fernandez led the rail strike. That, that was the All India Railway Men's Federation. And that paralyzed railway transport in India. And in those days, highways were hardly there. And all of India depended on the railways. That lasted 20 days until May 27. It was within the same month, while this rail strike was on, that 18th of May 1974. Now, all of you have great GK. What happened on 18th of May 1974? Buddha was smiling. That's when Pokhran 1 took place. And you can imagine in 1974, what a, what a pushback India would have faced from the rest of the world, particularly the Western world, because of this. It was all happening in the same crisis-ridden month. Within five weeks of that, that is on 28 June 1974, was the Indra Sri Mavo 
packed side and then this and then this action continued this was a very newsy one year period this action continues in the next year and, and before half of the next uh, next year is over india has absorbed sikkim as its own territory the sikkim parliament has thrown out the chogyal disqualified him and deposed him they have also held within two days of that a referendum where 97.5% vote to join india on 12 june 1975 that's all happening within the same 12 month period justice jagmohan lal sen of alabad high court he disqualifies her as an mp by setting aside her election from rai bareilly and within two weeks of that within two weeks of that that is 25th of june she imposes the emergency so this all of this happened in this very very news laden 12 months so once again if we go back before we say before we say for any year that this was the most news year in india's history the fact is we've had many 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 years in india's history that were extremely newsy and important and this year was one of those